Benvinguts, buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Bueno, primero dar las gracias tanto Europa Creativa, que nos ha apoyado en esta sesión, Film Market Hub, nuestro colaborador en las sesiones de Pitchbox, y deciros que esta es una de las sesiones de industria que más ilusión me hace, porque nos ha costado mucho traer a estos tres maestros de la creación de series, poder tener un triángulo perfecto en el cual vamos a abordar tres modelos distintos de trabajo, de esta nueva figura que todos tenemos en mente, los showrunners, y, y que nos produce una envidia sana ver que son capaces de aunar la producción y la creatividad para darnos productos tan singulares como los que ellos nos van a presentar y especialmente Nick, que es un amigo del festival, ya estuvo con nosotros hace cuatro años por su vertiente más literaria y que hoy lo traemos siendo un nombre excepcional de la producción de series, de la literatura y del cine. Hoy incluso estrena su película. Pero vamos, Yannick y Teresa, que nos acompañan representando cada uno de los modelos, el español, el nórdico, nos pueden aportar tantas matices de cómo se trabaja, de cómo se dirige una audiencia, que os remito a las charlas que han creado específicamente con cada uno, su forma de trabajar y su proceso creativo, que las tenéis online, y aprovechar el momento, que los tenéis aquí para poder preguntar. Y Alex, que nos acompaña y que nos explica esta complicidad natural con Siches. Me, me encanta tener esta complicidad con Mónica. Uh, uh, gracias, bienvenidos, bienvenidas. El programa Media uh, lleva 30 años en el mercado apoyando profesionalmente al sector audiovisual europeo, desde la formación a la exhibición. Y una de las líneas maestras donde hay más dinero es para la línea de televisión y plataformas, TV and online programming. De ahí ese romance con el Festival de Cine Siches, con Mónica y el equipo, para traeros estas tres superstars que han hecho otras cosas y ahora ofrecemos B2C esta sesión para vosotros que quedará grabada para la posteridad uh, y que, de la cual gozamos de un gran moderador, Víctor Sala, porque como si fueran dos discos de DJ, cuando termina este festival empieza otro en Barcelona que es Serializados Film Fest que él codirige, Víctor Sala. Y lo dejo aquí porque le dejo uh, la palabra a Victor Sala, que va a moderar la sesión. Thank you very much. Welcome. The session is going to be held in English. At the end, it's going to be time for Q&A. If you need it, will be a microphone. You, you request uh, to speak, and we, we provide the microphone. And there is a translator if you need it. So enjoy the session, and welcome. Thanks so much. Hello, hello. It's, yeah, it's working, yes. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Alex, for your kind presentation. As he mentioned, uh, I run a TV series festival and we are starting next Monday. So uh, why am I here? Because I have lots of work at, back at the office. I should not be here. But as you are here, uh, I wanted to meet these great creative people. So it's very nice to be uh, moderating this session. Um, and as they mentioned, they want to talk about the, the showrunner's work, this, this new word for us that uh, has been starting to be uh, a common ground in the, in the television industry uh, business, which before we always knew only as executive producer, creator, writers, and now showrunner is kind of the, the, the word that is trendy. It has been in some countries for more times than others. Uh, and that's why uh, I have this um, fantastic table uh, with here at my, at my first right, Nick Antosca, creator of shows like The Act, like Channel Zero, like uh, re very recently, you might have seen it, uh, brand new Cherry Fly Flavor. Please, uh, warm applause for him. Teresa Fernandez Valdez, uh, right next to him. She, I think it was like two days ago that Hollywood Reporter said that you were one of the top female <laughs> executives in TV Ooh. industry in the world. So uh, she is uh, <laughs> in Bamboo Producciones. It's one of the leading production companies here in Spain and they have uh, hits like Cable Girls, which was a global, global hit. They have worked in Velvet, in Fariña, in Gran Hotel. And they have one trend thing that is very funny, that is they are the ones opening the platforms with the new shows. <laughs> when Netflix comes to Spain, they do their first show with Netflix. When Apple comes here, they are doing it with Now and Then. It's like, the, it's the production company where all the platforms go to do their first show. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. 
And finally, uh, this very tall man from uh, Denmark, uh, Yannick Taib Mosholt, I hope I pronounce it yeah. correctly. Uh, <laughs> he is the creator of uh, uh, the first Scandinavian Netflix show, The Rain. Uh, and also he has worked in Rita, which also was a, a, a global hit in Netflix. He has worked uh, in uh, Borgen, which is a kind of popular uh, Danish show also. Uh, and a show that I really, really also love, which is Follow the Money. Uh, the, the, um, aquí, uh, here you can watch it on filming, which is La Ruta del Dinero. Dinero. So welcome, Yannick. Thank you. <laughs> First, I wanted to put the ground base of what is, like, how can we define the word showrunner? Like, um, is it different from these different perspectives and different countries? Like, how would you define um, a showrunner's job? How would you, how would you ex specifically call it, like, what's it, uh, how would you define it? Whoever wants to go first. Uh, I think. The U.S. market <laughs> is the one who was using that, so maybe he can explain, and I can see if it's the same <laughs> in Spain or not. Um, it, it's a uh, it's a moving target, right? Because it's different on every show. You look at the credits of a TV show, and there's um, there's the gaffer, there's uh, uh, the caterer, there's everything, but there's no credit that says showrunner. So um, the showrunner is is just the person who everybody on the show looks to for the creative and the managerial decisions on the show, which means that that person is in perpetual conflict because uh, the managerial and the creative are always uh, kind of butting heads. So showrunner is, is an impossible job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you would say like, um, it has, for a showrunner, like you were saying, this creative and this more producing and writing. No? So it's part of the creative, but also from the uh, working and making it happen kind of situation. Like, um, does it always have to be a writer? Or sometimes a producer can also behave as a showrunner, but actually not being the one typing the, the words in there? I mean, for us, it's almost always a writer. Yeah. For, for you? Yeah. For us, it's a new word, uh, a new word, and a new um, uh, it's, it's a new expression in Spain because it was true that I think that we were working like in two different areas. We had like the producer that it was in charge of the financials and, and to sell the series, and after that we had the, the script writer. So in the last years, we mixed that, and 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 the producers give or gave to the writers the opportunity to lead the shows. So that's why. To, to, to sign like a writer, it was less than your real job. So uh, I think it was an invitation for the creators to be more than writers. And it's true that now the showrunner is always like leading all the aspects. But uh, in, my, in my experience, they don't like to be very focused on the figures. On the, on the like budget, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the thing that they don't like to attend very much. So it's good to, to have a head uh, uh, over him or her in order to remind where we need to work is in terms of what figures. But it's true, we mix the... the I, I don't know the showrunner show who, who signed like showrunner and is not writing. Mm. Uh, sometimes you are not writing alone. Is you, you have a team, you are writing with more people, and, and maybe you are writing the pilot and maybe a couple of, 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 of scripts, but not the whole series, the, all yeah. the dialogues, not in Spain. We're, we're adopting some of the European model now more sometimes where a showrunner is writing the whole thing, but generally the, the showrunner is the writer of the pilot, the creator of the show, so if I'm a showrunner, it usually means I wrote or co-wrote the pilot, and then I, I or I and the co-creator hire all the other writers. Then we have a writer's room that goes for months, and we, we break out all the scripts, and everybody writes a script, but we oversee it, and we do kind of the last pass on, um, on, on every draft of the script. And then we see it through through the editing room and all that stuff. I think it's the same. I don't know your yeah, experience. It is kind of the same in Denmark. I mean, you can say that the whole Danish TV tradition was started because uh, people from the national Danish broadcast went to see how they did NYPD Blue. Yeah. Uh, and they 
basically just came back and said, all right, that's the way we're doing it. But we're still in a, like, in a transitional phase because I think most writers that I know at least, we all became writers because we didn't want to deal with people. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, it's true. And being like a showrunner means you have to deal with people all the time. So I think we're still, like in Denmark in general, we're still learning, but it is perceive that the, the core version lies with the creator, with the writers of the, the show. So we do have the chance to, to um, take all of that responsibility, but it's still like not everyone who feels comfortable yet doing it. So I think in Denmark right now, there's a lot of talk about writers also needing to learn how to become producers to actually take that re responsibility. And are you, are you guys on set? Are you uh, like yeah, during, when, talking to the actor? Like? For, at the beginning is when we are deciding like the tone and how the actors, maybe in the rehearsals, also in the, in the, when we read also the scripts, we, we are being ha beside the director always. We are like trying to build with him how it's going to work. But of course, the set, I try to respect that is the area for the director. So I, I, I avoid to be every day because if I'm there, Maybe it seems like I'm not trusting or or on on the on the director. So um, if I am go, if I'm coming or if I'm going with him to to sh to the shooting, um, it's because we are maybe open some location or there's a very difficult sense to 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 shoot or um, I don't know this a new or a big act or actress on set so it's to give them more more relevance so uh, I'm not it's not I'm not doing the like the whole um, sessions with the team is just attending the the things mm -hmm. that uh, uh, need me or I want to see or I want to to um, to supervise it was funny there was this uh, Spanish film uh, filmmaker Borja Cobeaga who told in one interview that he first noticed what a showrunner was when he was directing an episode of a, of a TV show. And after he finished the scene, he said, okay, I think it's good. And someone came to his ear and said, do another one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a showrunner. It's not actually yeah. me. No? When in set, you have someone that is almost above you that sometimes normally in movies, uh, the director would be king, although some producers yeah. could. In could my go. case, there's something that always has uh, strong, that is, I'm the owner of the company. So I don't know, in your case, it's the same. So you have like a voice very powerful. So when you go to set, it's not the showrunner is coming, it's like the big guy is coming. So you can hear like, agua, agua. It's like, <laughs> what? it's like the police is coming. <laughs> Something like that. So the walkie-talkies yeah, start to... See, it's like water, water. It's like, yes, it, it, what's happening? No, no. So, of course, the, we are very close. We, we work always like a family, but it's true that if you are there, is or if you go usually, or if not, seems like there's something happening. Mm -hmm. There is something happening. Yeah. And um, you were telling that you have your own company. I think you also build your own production company. You have also your own production company. And how was you, the starting of your careers? Like you started from a, a writer's point of view you and do go into writer's room and these kind of jobs or you were more into other kinds of uh, filmmaking jobs and then became this path? I mean, I, I started as a novelist. Um, I was writing short fiction. And then I kind of tripped and fell into TV a little bit. Um, and the traditional path, I, I don't know if it's how it works um, uh, in the Nordic model, but uh, you start as a staff writer and you just rise through the ranks. So it's like an, it's an apprenticeship system. So I spent five or six years in writer's rooms, you know, seeing showrunners like Brian Fuller, who did Hannibal and Sean Ryan um, and, and other bosses who were mentors uh, kind of showing how this is how you break story for 12 episodes or whatever. This is how you sustain and, and then getting to, you get to cover set, you get to go and see how production works. You get to see how the showrunner interacts with the director. And after a while of that, then I got an opportunity to run my own show, which was channel zero. And 
Um, and then after Channel Zero, I started my own company, which was almost an accident because I had put it as a, it was my vanity card, you know, how they had the little card at the end of the <laughs> credits. And when I started developing more stuff than I could handle by myself, I hired an, an executive to help me, uh, my producing partner, Alex Headland. And he said, well, the company will obviously be called, you know, what you <laughs> put on the thing, Eat the Cat, which is Save the Cat screenwriting book. We called our company Eat the Cat. Um, and that, that's how it happened. I believe that, like, in the Denmark, in the Nordics, as a general, we don't really do hierarchies. Mm -hmm. It's all, like, very flat. So we don't really have that ladder that you scale. Like, everyone who um, comes out of film school basically believes that, that, that they should just run their own show from the get-go. Um, and we also have, like, I mean, in many ways, I really do enjoy the idea that anyone at any level basically can have a say. But at the same time, sometimes, I mean, geez, you just discuss with everyone all the time. Um, But we're still, again, we're trying to like find out what is like, is there an approach? I mean, we talked about earlier that we do try, like when we do shows, we try to get not as experienced writers on board to actually make sure that we constantly get people through the ropes because you need to learn stuff mm -hmm. before you stand with all that responsibility. But again, it's it's still something that we're trying to build, and I don't really think we don't have a system yet. So we're like learning as we go along. I think this is this is actually a problem in the U.S. model now that it's because it's becoming more like the European model with short order seasons. The rooms are done writing before production starts, so there's way less opportunity mm. for younger writers to go on set and have that kind of apprenticeship. So people can kind of get a, a lot of experience in a writer's room, but have zero experience in yeah. production. So there, there's a huge gap in your yeah. knowledge when you then get an opportunity to be a showrunner and then you don't really know how set works or how you're supposed to interact with the director. Or that I kind think of thing. it's very important to buy the writers, not just the showrunner to go to set because when they write, sometimes they cannot <coughs> imagine. They know, I can imagine that it's going to be expensive, but sometimes it's more than expensive. It's what is, what, what, What is uh, it's like to do this? What is going to happen? What we need is maybe something that we need, of course, a green screen and a swimming pool. And the green screen is part, and the, other, the swimming pool is there, and the sea is there. So it's one sea. Sun maybe it takes like three days in different three locations, and you cannot imagine that because you don't know all that kind of thing that's happened shooting. So um, I think it's, it's good to know. Uh, the process. I think as much as they can be linked, the, the show is going to be better. Also, because you can appreciate the um, the the chemistry between some some characters sometimes or some actors, because we are not talking about act, act, uh, characters. We are talking about pe people that are working together, and sometimes you. You can see that, wow, I cannot imagine that that woman with that man or two that guys are going to be like so connected and you can, they can inspire you to write more because sometimes when you are shooting, you are still writing the season and you can redrive or rebuild the, the story attending that kind of thing. So I think it's nice to involve the writers to see more than the, the, the traditional market give to them. It's funny how you're talking like how the Denmark uh, industry went to the United States uh, and tried to copy the NYPD Blue uh, style. And now you were saying like America is trying to copy the shorter versions of series. No, how, how these two worlds are kind of um, mixing uh, each other and trying to, to resemble and to learn from one another. Um, do you think, um, I know your shows, you've been always doing it in America, but Do you think it's very different from your own perspective if you were doing a show in Europe or 
in the States. I think Teresa has some experience doing some shows, like um, mixing uh, in a co-production with, with... Little experience, yeah, because some... Uh, for Apple, for example, we, we, we went to Miami to show... Miami is not pure US, I think it's a mix <laughs> between US and Latin, but uh, the rules are American rules, and we learn a lot, because for us it was so hard to go there. It's not a question of money, because Apple have the money. It's a question of... Uh, unions. What is the big union? It's miles of unions, and uh, to to negotiate with managers, strong managers that they like to package to, to pack everything. So the pressure is so strong shooting there, and this is really new for us. Uh, in terms of shooting, no, of course, you have the time to shoot, you know when you start, when you finish, the, when you need to stop. This is something that you can manage. But the previously, the pre-production is, is, for us, was harder in, in the U.S. than in Spain. Especially for the two things that you were mentioning, the, the one of the unions and how to have the, like, the crew is uh, different. Uh, now yeah. there's the... the Threat or the the conversation of the of the strike that the, it might happen if the conditions are not changing. Are you um, how are you feeling all this movement now? Um, I hope they get what they want. Uh, that what they're asking for is totally reasonable. Uh, they're asking for you know um, some some rest in the evenings and and the way that we work crews and the way that we work ourselves in production. At least in the U.S., is exhausting. You know, you get to the end of a, a five, six, seven month shoot, and you are like totally exhausted. You know, mm -hmm. and and they Because regularly it's like work twelve or thirteen hours or per day. How? Some, I mean, I, for for shows that I've done, we've never gone beyond thirteen some hours and change. But some shows go to sixteen hours, seventeen hours. Sometimes it's exhausting. But in Spain, it's impossible it's, to do um, that. Yeah, no, what, what the unions are asking for is totally reasonable, and I hope they get it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, the two things that you were mentioning that surprised you more from working uh, in America were the, the unions, and you said the, the packaging of the agents. Can you develop more what you were talking? No, Teresa. No, me? Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, because they want to be... I'm sorry, because maybe someone is here. <laughs> I have good friends, man. <laughs> But... You know, they have the, 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 when you negotiate, they, they do through their own lawyers. They do like the business affair, they call. And it's people that they know very well the law, but they didn't know anything about the business. I'm sorry. So when you are talking about to shoot or not shoot or the new seasons or whatever, it's like I need to give them like a, like a, a big course. It's like, it's, they, they, it's like, You cannot imagine. It's really difficult to, to, to understand the connection. And when you have an agent, also they, they want to, to offer, a, just you are asking for an actor, and they, they, they want to give you an actor and two writers and one director. And, so big, and, and finally, you, you, you find like you are, you are dealing three, 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 like three agreements, but the the actor that you were looking for is not <laughs> there. So it's like a tricky, all the time it's like, oh, what, what is happening there? Like, I came to ask for Jack and suddenly I have three and Jack is busy with another people. So um, I feel like they have uh, their own, the, 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 the managers and the agency have uh, a strong power and they, they are also, um, I think they are like, Uh, characters, <laughs> and I think they are like they want to be main characters. <laughs> Real players of the real of the players. It's true. So um, it, it's something new for us. It's something new here. You have an agent, and you discuss the, or the terms of the deal. Or but they are so 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 protagonists of the mm -hmm. moment in pre-production. So. If, to close one person, maybe the, the one actor have involved like three or four people around. It's like this is the manager, this is the agent, this is the one. And I said this is the business affair. This is, and I said, wow, it's it's impossible to 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 progress fast. Mm -hmm. Takes time 
to shoot in the US takes time. Mm -hmm. And how is it in Denmark? Did you find these kind of problems or? No, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we're not, D -D -D Denmark is a very small country. And a lot of the time it seems like the f movie business is just something we pretend, like it's <laughs> something we play. Um, because, I mean, everyone basically knows each other because it's so tightly knit. Um, I've had experiences with Americans and with the American system, and it both fascinates me and frightens me <laughs> um, because it's so intense. <laughs> it's like... Um, but, I mean, in the, the, the Denmark, we're still like... a tightly knit community and it's quite interesting to see what's happening with like now that we have Netflix have entered Denmark, Amazon are entering, Apple are entering, they're all entering and they come with like a whole nother system, a whole nother way of doing things and they kind of demand a certain professionalism that we didn't really have before. Um, but we do learn a lot, and I and I think it's basically for the good of all of us because it means that we also like coming back to as we started talking about the idea of the showrunner, like what is it that you do and stuff. These international services having entered Denmark has kind of demanded that we stop playing around and actually start taking ourselves just a little more seriously than what we did. Before and I do think that as like a business, it really makes a difference, and we've really started to actually like, yeah, mm -hmm. find paths that that work and create like a process, like a real professional movie making or series making process. Both of you three have worked with, with Netflix, and I think the reality is, is a bit different in, in, in these cases, but you were mentioning, like, um, I'm, come from, I'm coming from a, from a small country, but uh, Netflix wants to do the first uh, Scandinavian mm -hmm. show, and you got the, the, the job. And it's like, how do, you, how do you try to do this show um, when you think about who's going to be the target? Um, of uh, how do you th do you think a lot like as you mentioned like Denmark is a small country, you are starting to think a lot on the global audience. Does that change anything in the story that you're trying to portray? No, I do. I mean, I've always we are like a few people who, for the last 15 years, have talked a lot about how much we wanted to do genres because we grew up on horror films and on his reading Stephen King and Dina Koons and all of that stuff, Clive Barker. But we've never done that in Denmark. We do like realistic drama, so we do like crime. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, before it was just impossible, I had like a box full of projects that I Started, started to write on, but that I just knew it would never get made. So when we heard that Netflix were like looking for projects in Denmark, my first thought was just, okay, let's open that box because they must be open to this. They must be open to try to actually use genres like do sci-fi do post up like a little epic shit and try to like combine it with the, 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 the Danish I don't know what it is but and they were open to it so I I think that of course you always like you know you know the network so you know like if you've got a certain project you know if it fits them or not but when Netflix came it was just the dream that they would be open to do this that we would finally be able to do genres in the Nordics mm -hmm. that we had never really done before and 
they were. So we just felt super lucky and super privileged that we got the chance to go in that direction because that was basically what we've always had dreamt of. That's that's great. And I think Teresa had a similar experience. Yeah, but uh, no, I, I was thinking that he he was he's he was going to say that I opened that and 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 after that they, they asked for for the, the series that you were that more local series that the one that you was dreaming. No. no 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 they they I had this project in the box and I um, asked Netflix if they would be interested in it. And they said yes. And in a very, I think, sometimes Netflix way, they called up a week after that and said, let's do it. And I was like, okay, so let's start like working on it. And no, no, they said, no, 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 we're doing it. And we are <laughs> airing it in two weeks or something. I mean, they have <laughs> okay, you've no, got the contract on your home now. In, <laughs> in our case, it was a little bit different. We have also some projects in the box and, and we were dreaming to do science, uh, science fiction and other kind of genres because uh, Bamboo Producciones always produce uh, like big period series, big love stories, big, uh, big woman uh, and, and, and um, you know, powerful uh, woman uh, driving their own lives or, okay. And also we have another kind of stories and we didn't have the place in Spain to sell them. So uh, when Netflix came to Spain, we dream, we, we dream mm -hmm, yeah. with, with the idea to do something different. So in that case, we were in everything outside and said, oh, look, ah, finally we can do something different. And I said, oh, no, <laughs> we're coming to ask you for this thing that you're doing so well. <laughs> and we said, what? And they said, yes, because Velvet and Gran Hotel are two titles that you have and now are in our platforms, in our platform. So it's working amazing world well. And, and we want something similar of that. Mm -hmm. And we said, oh my God, so we need to do it again. <laughs> okay. And it was the cable girls, of course. We had ch chance to change the model and to do new things and connect the past with the present. Maybe we can talk about that if you like. So there's th something new that comes with Netflix for sure. But the dream to change totally our mind and to, to produce a show uh, opposite or coming from another reference, it was not possible. Mm -hmm. You hoped for a change and yeah. for an edgy more thing and then no. you said, no, but you're very specialized no. and good yeah. at doing that exactly. See, what. I said always like, look guys, when we are talking internally in the, in the team and they said, oh, we're never going to do that. And I said... Okay, it's like we are the best doing churras, for example. <laughs> nobody's coming to ask for a chuleton of meat. It's like <laughs> nobody's coming to ask for the beef or the ribs. They're coming for churros, so we need to do churros. <laughs> it's difficult when you are good doing something uh, to, to try to change your business. Because mm -hmm. they said, why? No, I'm coming to... For the huevos fritos, why are you mm. ask me, given to like something very sophisticated? Or I do want, you want the to typical. The chef. Yeah, it's already working. <laughs> it's like that. And for the audience, like when you were planning with the show, um, do they give you any feedback of trying to appeal more South America or trying to go for broader audiences in any way uh, for for cable girls or something like that or not? No. Uh, sometimes when we said, ah, oh, but this uh, theme was like. Uh, we treat that theme in another series. Uh, maybe we can look for another one. They said, no, no, no. But look, maybe it's not new for spam, but it's new for others. So the boys, the women boys. No, sometimes we said, oh, the, the women in Spain, we are not there anymore. So maybe we can avoid that chapter. And they said, no, because others in Latam, they are still, the women are still mm -hmm. at home. The, the women are still like behind their husbands. So we need to have also that voice in one character. So they, they, they remind you that they, it must be there. But, mm -hmm. but uh, the real thing is like, in my experience, the platform who came to Spain want to conquer Spain. So if the content travel after that is going to be amazing. But the, the, the point for them is like to have really new subscribers in your country. Mm -hmm. So... It's very important not to bring people from other countries. It's more 
connect with your audience, with your public, with your local audience. And after that, maybe second season, third season, you can start like mixing this, say like, this show is working very well in Colombia or in Chile, or why we don't try to bring some character from there to here and we can connect the story. Um, and you start working on that. But at the beginning, they, they want Apple, is, they're really focusing the Spanish speakers. Uh, in Spain, they, they, it's going to be the first show, so they need to, 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 to demonstrate internally that makes sense to produce in Spain for Spain. So the big goal is to, to conquer your own audience. And also one, that one new platform that we are working with is Start Play. Uh, in Spain, is coming next year, so we're preparing a new show for them. And also, they're, they are really focusing how we can have the attention of the public in Spain. Mm -hmm. So it's big, huge, big, big in your in your own country of production, and I think that's always kind of in the the attitude in the in the states thinking about audience. You already take for granted like that it would travel because it has always kind of traveled a lot. Uh, American shows everywhere, but I no? mean, uh, well, I think that that used to be true with mm. the the broadcast shows, um, with Netflix shows. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I haven't seen behind the fortress walls of Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. Like all the algor algorithms and the numbers and all that stuff. But um, I mean, our, our Netflix show is a horror show about a woman who throws up cats. So uh, I don't I think they gave up on it pretty quickly in terms of like mass appeal. And the budget was low enough. They just kind of said, well, this is going to be a niche show. And, um, you know, all right. All right. Do what you're going to do. So, um, but you had Eric Lange, uh, Rosa Salazar, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Catherine Keener. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's yeah. a niche show, but it's pretty amazing I cast mean, and very yeah, good show. Yeah, they they do share the numbers of people who watched it with you at a certain point, mm. and it's more people than have watched any of my other shows. Mm. I, you know, partly as a as a function of um, Netflix's global reach. You know, that's uh, that's part of the 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 blessing of Netflix. You can um, you can experiment. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's. I, I think it's a it's a game changer. We were talking before. No, the Bon Jong Ho's award, uh, like uh, when he was uh, collecting the Academy Award and was telling, like, now you, people can read this part of the bottom. But they have <laughs> subtitles and things are traveling. No, it's it's kind of a game changer. Absolutely, that a Danish show can be huge everywhere, or um, things are things are changing. No, and um, but when you try to produce these kind of shows? Like, do you have in mind these 197 countries or I don't know how much countries, or is something that it's just talking about the show that, that you're working on and that's it? I mean, with, I think from my end at least, we're just trying to do the shows that we l would love to do um, and not think too much about all of that because it's so bizarre. I mean, when we did the rain when the first season was about to premiere and we weren't sure if we were doing another season or not, Netflix basically says to us, Brazil will decide. And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then after two weeks, they called up and said, Brazil are super happy. <laughs> and we're like, okay, <laughs> great. So we're doing more, but it's just so, I mean, it's really, of course, I always try to, think of the audience because I would love there to be an audience and I and I see myself as the audience in a way like what would I be excited about but in the end I have no idea and I can't really I mean the idea of there being I don't know how many m m million people just makes no sense to think of because I can't con control it so I just tend to try to focus on what I at least most of the time can control, which is all about what we're do, 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 doing. And then when it's d d d done, we just close our eyes and cross our fingers and hope. <laughs> you both, uh, you all three have this job, which is uh, very difficult uh, to be a showrunner because you have to answer all these questions all the time at all the process of the, of the filmmaking, of the writing, of the post-production, of everything. Um, do you have any do's and don'ts that you could recommend to the room? Um, some advice 
of things. Uh, maybe it's not to have this profession. It's too stressful. <laughs> maybe that could be one. I'm not sure. But uh, Or no, it's the best profession in the world because you're the creator and you have total control. Any do's and don'ts for this kind of job? Um, I When friends of mine become showrunners or get their first show, if, if I ever give advice, it, it's don't panic. Don't <laughs> panic because there's, there's going to be so much pressure and so many um, curveballs and so many seeming crises and the worst thing you can do is freak out because it'll it'll always get worse um, and uh, but then it'll get better um, but it's just it's a, such a far-ranging job it's such a, a, a chaotic unpredictable job it's also like not working in a coal mine it's an amazing job it's, it's yeah wonderful. I think it, this is the value like to you, you never know what is happening tomorrow never. So never, nothing is under control, never. So it's like a, a, a risk, risky sport, I think, something like that. So that's why we, we live with a strong passion, our own career. It's like, I think there's no limit between the, 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 como diría, tiempo de ocio, the, the, the no time. There's no free time or. Yeah. Is, is we don't have the difference or the limits between your job and your ta your free time. It's because everything is all the time the same, and you you watch a film and you are thinking about solutions for your show, or maybe you are uh, uh, watching a show and you said, oh, maybe my next show can have something. So your mind is always working. Sometimes I don't know you, but probably yes. When you go to sleep, suddenly you wake up with the solution that you was mm. looking for. So. Even if you are sleeping, you're working, so it's really crazy. So, uh, of course, I, I invite all the people who love this um, this work to 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 try and to try and to try. And it's true that the shows are not just our shows. It's true that we are following our inner voice, but you need to learn also how to attend the clients because they're paying. So. This is a service, and how you you need to to develop your your best way to convince to convince the people to follow you or uh, to trust on you or to seduce, because in terms of of uh, what you're feeling is trust on me. We we can go and maybe it's going to be <laughs> a failure. So how how you can this is a hard moment also to learn and in Spain we don't have that culture of, of failure so you need to learn that not always is going to work or probably is not going to work and start again and start again and trust in you again or trust in others so I think there's a lot of people very creative around you and they can give you also some points that maybe it's good to take care of them because you are not alone. You are the last voice, but there's a lot of voices trying to give you new signs about how it can grow. So I, I invite them to enjoy and don't go. It's like it's going to be hard, but it's going to be wonderful at the same time. Yeah, I think it's sort of in the same vein, actually. I think the most important thing is to hold on to your initial vision, but do not hold on too tight because you still need to, like, you need to listen to your surroundings. I mean, I've tried it a thousand times where you just get, you, you get so adamant on something and you're like, no, it's supposed to be like this. And people are like saying to you, but perhaps it doesn't make that much sense. Or perhaps and you're just like, it needs to be like this. And then when you see it in the editing room, you're like, oh God, I should have listened to someone. <laughs> and that's just, so you just need to like constantly flex between the two, <laughs> the two, I think, but you need to like keep on going back to what was it you actually wanted this project to be. Because the worst thing is to sit in the end of a project, being it a, a film or a series and whatever, and you just suddenly realize that you can't feel it anymore because it became something else along the, the, the way. So 
just like hold on to it. And then I think also like the something really important is to like just keep on making decisions because you can always change them if they're not right. But it, it, everything stops when you don't. So you just like need to be ready to keep on making decisions, which is sometimes super frightening, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to sum up a bit, and now we're going to open up for the audience to have, we have 10 minutes to, to answer your questions. A showrunner is someone that is not in the credits, but <laughs> it can have a title of a writer, of a creator, or a producer. Uh, it's someone that normally comes from a writer's uh, origin, so it's a writing mm -hmm. per person, but has to deal with budget and producing, or has to deal with dealing with people, which can be afraid for some writers. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that recommended to a showrunner is to hold a vision, but maybe not too tight. <laughs> and above all, don't panic and take decisions, uh, keep taking decisions nonstop. So that, that would be our definition of a showrunner, more or less. It's great. <laughs> yeah. So I think if you have any questions for any of the three people here on stage, please, it's your moment. Anyone fan of the show? Any more questions related to working in Denmark, in Spain, in America? A uh, uh, microphone is coming. Hello. Uh, since you are uh, working inside the industry, I wanted to know where do you think we are heading to? Uh, talking about content of formats, what kind of format is going to be in the uh, future? The formats. I'm sorry. The content, yes. The format. The what kind of series? What kind of? Is coming. Yes. What's next? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. All of them. <laughs> all all, all yeah. the contents, all the formats. Yeah. It's going to be it's a global thing. Like Squid Game is the most popular thing in the world right now. It's unthinkable five years ago. Yeah. I think there's like more opportunity than ever. So I think that it depends on the platform or the, 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 all of them are looking for news new things, new contact, new surprise. They want to be impacted like this um, crazy series. No? It's, who can imagine that a, Kore a Korean show is going to be the, the big, big show of Netflix? I think they also were not expecting that. It was a surprise also for them. So I think it's the moment to create. <laughs> it's the moment to create and, and the moment to be original and the moment to 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 try because there's m more doors than ever so um i think we cannot follow a trend because when you you're going to launch your show it's going to be late uh, the, before i said like the things take time so when you are starting to think about something until you can launch that maybe it takes two years so um, we cannot we cannot really follow the 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 trends that are 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 now on the table. So yeah. I think the good thing is like our industry is growing, our industry is shining and is open. Uh, before it was so hard to travel. Uh, we had more points because the Spanish had more connection with other countries, so our language was helpful. But um, look, for me, it was a surprise to see that American people is attending Europe. Is I don't know that that they are really staring at us. So it's good to to hear that because um, I think there, the, the, like we have different cultures and uh, we have the opportunity to sell concept that before it was impossible because you cannot find the the free TV. And the platform, you thought that it was just for the American market. So I think the, the opportunities are, are for all kind of, of content, as, as, as you mentioned. And as Nick was saying before now, like maybe the trend in America is to do shorter shows, no? more like the British style of doing uh, shorter shows, but maybe it's something that is happening now and in two years. It's going back to where it was before, so you never know with trends. You how need to try, because we don't have the key of the success, so you need to try, and suddenly it's uh, a big uh, 
or huge success. Another question? There's a question there. Because I'm going to do the first one before the mic arrives. How many projects do you develop at the same time in order to get one green light? Like, uh, for instance, I think I, I heard in an interview with you today said that you were bringing to Netflix five shows or four shows, and they picked Cable Girls. But they were like five shows prepared, a bit of development in each of them. How many projects are you working on the same time till one gets green light and you focus on that one? I think all of us, we have like the big box with a lot of ideas inside. Yeah. Because the ideas come to you. It's not that, it's like to go shopping. Not always you find the things that you are <laughs> looking for. So one day you are very inspired or in one trip or, and suddenly, or you read something and inspire you and you create a lot of concepts or ideas or one month is very active and two are really uh, horrible. So. Uh, you have different concepts kept and, and one day uh, you have the opportunity to, to present them. I like to, depends on the company, sometimes if you are very, very connected with one idea, you, you can bring one idea and try to sell it. But in the way to, in, in, my, in my company, the way to understand what they are looking for, when Nisa first visit, like a, a cold call, when you go for first time to Amazon and we don't have any reference about what they are looking for for Spain, we try to bring different concepts mm -hmm. and maybe they are comment or they, they are telling to you about the different ideas that you are bringing and you are not correct with the selection, but they are giving to you feedback and in that feedback are message about what they're looking for. So if you bring three, you have more opportunities to sell than if you just bring one. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, like you said, um, about how long things take. It takes two years to get a show in the air if you're lucky from when you start developing it to when your camera starts rolling. So if, you, if, if you're just working on that show and then you finish that show, even if it's a success, then you got like two or three years mm -hmm. before you get to make another show if you're starting from scratch again. So most writers and creators that I know have multiple things in multiple stages of development. And then sometimes there's a, a train pile up, you know, where you can be shooting a show or editing one show, you can mm. be writing another yeah. show, and, um, and, and then you're like in the, you know, you're in production on a different show. So you're doing it's three true. shows at once in different stages and they're kind of rolling and leapfrogging each other. And because our feeling or my feeling is like the industry is not going to wait for you. So if you stop three years, maybe if you want to come back, it's going to be hard because there's new voices, new, new people working. So to have something in the oven is, is good. Mm. The question that was over there. Hey, do you think that um, streaming platforms should be made to release their data in the sense of like viewing figures and things like that? Do you think that would help in the creative process? I don't know if it would help in the creative process, but it would help compensate writers and creators more fairly for successful shows. So, you know, the way it works now, and I don't have a really analytical understanding of this, but like you don't know that you, you don't get paid more residuals for Stranger Things than you do for some obscure show like mine, <laughs> like it, which, you know, isn't fair. Like if you make Squid Game or, or Stranger Things, you should, um, I, you should, I think your residuals should reflect how many viewers watch that. Um, you know, the, the compensation for that is you get an overall deal or something like that, but it does seem wrong for the, for the viewership to be untethered to the rewards, I think. So I, just for that reason, I think it would be a good thing to have more data. I think there's a battle here in Europe trying to promote like all these uh, writers' rights of getting some authorship money uh, through the companies that collect that. And it's like the platforms came here and they absolutely uh, put the American model first with the residuals, which is very far away from what it was common here. And now there's this also battle, legal battle, trying to bring it to the European model, but it's still not 
uh, there, but it's uh, starting to seems like move a bit. I'm not sure if it's true, Teresa. You look at me like I very think skeptical. The, the, the time was enough to get something, and it never happened. So I think it's a, a, the data is like a dark issue. It's like I, I never hear that one platform said this series was a failure. If you feel if you if you can follow the news, always are a success, always. And I have failures in my career, but now that I work for platforms, not anymore. So, <laughs> or really, I'm the best, <laughs> or there's something that they are not telling to you, because uh, sometimes they don't split. Okay, they can tell you we're not going to have a, a next season because it's, it's not as strong enough. But they never tell you that. Look, nobody's. Is looking at that, so I this is a business, and they want subscribers, so they cannot tell them, "Look, these six months, everything that I gave you, nobody like it." Because also tell things about them, who are selecting that, who are telling what kind of decisions. So it's not a responsibility just from the creator side. Just it's like a partnership, so they give you uh, notes, they 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 push you to some place. So, um, and I think the people that we work that work like me in free TV, we had before reference about if your show is more for male, female, young people or not. Now we are it's diff it's difficult to learn now. It's really difficult because you are alone. Uh, you just have like a little reference about it. It's, it's like, sometimes I said, please, it's like with the children. It's a one to five, what is the note? It's from one to five. It's three, it's four, it's five. It's because I need to understand because if they don't give me uh, details, I need to analyze the content that I was producing in order to do it better for them the next time. So I think it would be great to know more. It's, it's, it's just not a question of money that also is to try to, to do it better and to learn. Mm -hmm. But they are keeping all the data with them and not sharing. Yeah. <laughs> but as you said, it is opening up though. They are like trying to, uh, I know the, different skills around Europa trying to get this system in place. And at least in Denmark, there's always been this opening because the Danish Musicians Guild have contracts in place that say that, you, that they need to know the numbers. Mm -hmm. So they actually get the numbers. So we've been able to sometimes like squeeze out the numbers <laughs> from the Danish musician <laughs> skills just to have like some, but, mm. but I mean, it, I, I think it will change in a way. And I think it, in many ways, it seems like they have also realized that they have to give more than they have been giving. But of course, knowledge being power and everything, they want to hold on to it for as long as they can, but I think it'll change over time. Now we know, if we want to know the numbers, we need to put a Danish uh, <laughs> score <laughs> exactly. on an artist and then uh, ask him to get the numbers. I think we are, we are over time. Thanks a lot, Nick, Teresa and Yannick. Gracias. Thank you.